Such a good Savior we have, worthy of our praise. Amen? How are we doing? <laughs> Tricked you on that. Revelation, sermon number three, a title if you need a title. Anyone here need a title? You just can't handle the preaching of God's Word without a title for your notes. If that's you, it's a crown and a name. A crown and a name. Let me ask you a question as you turn in your Bibles to Revelation chapter 2. We'll be going through the whole second chapter today. And so I've just already begged for forgiveness for the three-hour sermon. Uh, Each one of these churches should really be taken in one sermon. So I'm going to really fly today. So if I don't address everything then you can come set up a, a time to have coffee or something and we'll chat about what you missed. But I'm going to give you enough to take something home with. As you're turning to Revelation chapter 2, let me start with a question. Uh, here we go. Basic question. Very simple to answer. What are you living for? What are you living for? If that question sounds too big, too grand... Let me ask you this, what motivates you to get out of bed every day? What motivated you to get out of bed today? What will motivate you to get out of bed tomorrow? What entices you to work a little harder, push a little longer? What is the carrot that dangles on the end of the stick encouraging you to keep running the race of life? I ask because we all live for something. For some, it's dreams and hopes and aspirations. For us, others, it's, it's the responsibility to family, children, friends. And maybe even to some, the, the will to live is simply just the fear of death. We all live for something. In the letters to the seven churches... We're going to take four of them today. Jesus specifically is going to address each of these churches, and yet each letter contains four commonalities. Number one, they each have a reminder of who it is that is speaking to them. This is the Savior, the King, Jesus, who is addressing his churches. Number two, they each hold an encouragement. Number three, they each hold a rebuke or... If they are not rebuked, they they get a warning, some kind of warning. And number four, they all end with a call to persevere and a reward for doing so. So I want you to notice those four aspects in each of these letters. So let's dive in. The first church is the church of Ephesus. Verse 1 of chapter 2 says this, To the angel of the church in Ephesus write, The words of him who holds the seven stars in his right hand, who walks among the seven golden lampstands. Father God, we pray that as we read your word, as I preach your word, as we hear, let us have ears that hear. Let us have ears that that do not long to be tickled and fancied, but ears that would hear truth, that we would confess and repent where necessary. We would hold on to hope always, and that we would continue to be sanctified into the image of Jesus until we see him face to face. Complete that in us now, we pray in the name of Jesus. We said, Jesus is writing through John, and he says, I am the one who holds the seven stars. And again, if you were here last week, you know that the seven stars are symbolic of the seven angels of the seven churches, the messengers of those churches. And Jesus not only holds the angels in his hand, he walks among the seven golden lampstands, which again, last week, is revealed to be symbolic of the seven churches. Each church is a lampstand, shining the light of Christ into the world. Again, Jesus is very present. He's very active. He's holding. He's keeping. He's walking. 
He's walking among his churches. This is a big thing. Jesus knows what's going on. Not because he's peering down from heaven through the clouds, but because he's active and walking among us. Hold on to that thought as we now go to the encouraging portion. Verse 2. I know your works, your toil, and your patience, and how you cannot bear with those who are evil, but have tested those who call themselves apostles and are not, and found them to be false. I, I know you are enduring patiently and bearing up for my name's sake, and you have not grown weary. I know your works, Jesus says, your works, your deeds, your actions. Remember, salvation isn't a get-out-of-jail-free card, get-out-of-hell-free card. You don't receive salvation and then sit on the sidelines. Salvation is not just freedom from hell. Salvation is life transformation. It is being transformed from a trajectory of the kingdom of this world and its sin and its folly to the kingdom of heaven. Being, again, reoriented to what Christ in in the triune God created at the very beginning a life of purpose to have stewardship and dominion over everything that God had created on this earth. So friends, make sure that your salvation isn't treated as a get-out-of-hell-free card, but instead is seen as the life-transforming, purpose-given reality that it is. Remember Ephesians 2.10, again, Paul writes to this church in Ephesus. He says, he reminds them, for we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. You are not saved by works, but rather for works, rescued from slavery and given purpose, a life to live. So Jesus says, I know your works. And not only do I know your works, I know your toil and your patient endurance. These are not Easy works. There is toil involved, burden, struggle, strain, exertion, even hardship. And not only are these not easy works, these are not quick works. This is the work of a farmer. Anyone ever done any farm work? The lights are bright, so I can't see. We're just too modern these days, right? We think growing our little herbs in our windowsills is our farming. Even that, though, takes some kind of patient endurance. I don't think it takes any toil, but there's an endurance. You can't just grow your basil and eat it the next day. You've got to wait for it to mature. There's something about farming work that takes patience and endurance. You don't plant and next day harvest. You have to patiently, and then by endurance, if you've ever had a garden, you know, I think... Intro gardeners think, this is going to be so great. I'm going to put my little raised box and put my stuff in and boom, after three months there it'll be. And they don't realize there's this evil thing in the world called weeds. And you can't just look at the weeds and they disappear. You've got to get down on your hands and knees and dig those things out. It's tiring, isn't it? This is called farming work. It takes toil and patient endurance. And you know what? It's not flashy. You ain't going to be on the cover of Time magazine with your toiling, patient, enduring work. Doesn't take an Armani suit. Takes a pair of Levi's and a flannel shirt. Sweat. Now I want you to underline something here. But again, John has already said, go back to, just look at Revelation 1.9. John says, I, John, your brother and partner in the tribulation... And the kingdom, and what? The patient endurance. And now here Jesus is commending the church in Ephesus on their patient endurance. This is going to be a common theme throughout the entire book. I'm just going to start beating the anvil over and over that this is the number one thing you need to take from this book. This book is not written so you can know when Jesus is going to come back, so you can know if you're going to get raptured, so you can know uh, what the millennium is. Those things are tertiary at best. The number one thing you need to hear over and over is no matter what the end looks like, you need to patiently endure. Not escape. Not try to make America great again. Patiently endure. 
endure. You should just say it to yourself over and over and over as you read the news, as you engage in social media. What does it mean to patiently endure? And then he goes on, Jesus says, you cannot bear with those who are evil. You cannot bear with them. You, you don't tolerate them. And in fact, this is what that looks like. There's an action. You test those who call themselves apostles and are not. The church in Ephesus asks the right questions. When people come by and say, you know, I'm, a, I'm an apostle. I've got some words to say. They don't just go, well, there's the stage. Teach us, O oh apostle. They actually have some questions to ask. Some good questions for us to ask would be, what is the gospel? You call yourself a Christian, tell me what the gospel is. What's your view of the scriptures? Is, is, is this the word of God or is this just another one of the religious relics that we can take some kind of wisdom from? What is your practice of confession, repentance, and sanctification? Again, asking good questions. And what they find were the wrong answers. They found them to be false. And this is a good thing. There are no itching ears in Ephesus. They're not coming to hear the latest self-help. They're not coming uh, to the Sunday gathering just to be inspired. They're coming to hear the word of God so that they would experience confession and repentance and sanctification. So that there would be continually godly growth and godly fruitfulness in their lives until they see Jesus face to face. Would it be known of us today that there are things, that there are evils that Harbor Church would be known does not tolerate, does not bear? It's an easy time to start to give in to the things of this world and to start to get gray on black and white issues because we feel like... I don't know, I just want to have influence. So let's not, let's start to tolerate slippery slope. Not only do they not bear with those who are evil, he, he goes on, I know you are enduring patiently, notice it once again, and bearing up for my name's sake and have not grown weary. They are enduring patiently. Again, this is this primary call throughout this book. And they are bearing up. What does that mean? They're enduring in the face of hardship and suffering. They're enduring the endurance. Double enduring. And why? Why are they doing this? They're doing it for the name of Jesus. You're familiar with Philippians 2. Five, have this mind among you, which is, in, which is yours in Christ Jesus, the, who though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but made himself nothing, taking the form of a servant. This is the incarnation. Being born in the likeness of men and being found in human form, he hum, humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. A life of worship and devotion to God the Father, which allows him to be the one sacrifice once and for all on the cross. And therefore God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name so that the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of the Father. They are living out of this reality right now. They're not waiting until they see Jesus face to face to bow. Their lives are bowed. Their tongues are confessing. We live for the name of Jesus. That is why we patiently endure, because our eyes are set on the eternal kingdom, not the kingdom of this world. And here's the most striking thing I find out of this. Jesus says he knows that they're enduring patiently, that they're bearing up for the name's sake, and they've not grown weary. Anyone grown weary over the last year? And easy to grow weary. How do we keep from growing weary. Well, guess what? The Bible tells us. Hebrews chapter 12, the author says, therefore, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and sin which clings so closely. And let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, looking to Jesus the founder and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is seated at the right hand of the throne of God. We can run the race 
Because we see how King Jesus ran the race. He is the greatest example. But he's so much more than an example. He's the one who ascends to the Father and sends his Spirit to empower us to run the race. How do we run this race without growing weary? We have to keep our eyes on Jesus. And, and who? The author and perfecter of our faith. See, our, our journey is about a faith journey, not a self journey. We don't run this race to make much of ourselves. We don't run this race to earn accolades. We run this race for the glory of King Jesus. And we run it empowered by the Spirit. We may be a little weary because we're empowered by self. We may be a little weary because our eyes are not on the kingdom. They're on the things of this world, the fears and anxieties and calls and wooings. Verse number 4, Revelation 2, here's the rebuke. But I have this against you. You have abandoned the love you had at first. Remember, therefore, from where you have fallen. Repent and do the works you did at first. If not, I will come to you and remove your lampstand from its place unless you repent. Yet this you have. You hate the works of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. You never want to get to the letter where it's all, man, I, you guys are awesome, but not the butts we were looking for. I don't even know what that means. <laughs> Sorry, I'm tired. But I have this against you. <laughs> My online audience is really, just bear with us today. You have abandoned your love you had at first. Now, here's the thing. I've heard this message probably, I've heard this text preached probably a hundred times, at least a hundred times. And I've never, I've always heard this is about your love for God. You've abandoned God. And that's true. But there's something else at play. What is the greatest commandment? Matthew 22, what does Jesus say is the greatest commandment? You shall love the Lord your God all your soul, heart, and mind, and you shall love your neighbor as yourself. These are the two greatest commandments. All the law and the prophets hang on these things. Here's the reality. Ephesus has lost their love of God. They are doing works, but their works are duty and not delight. Do you delight in the works God has for you? Or is there... Drudgery. So kind of frustration and complaining. Again, I believe that if you are doing any kind of ministry that we have on Sundays, people down below, first floor doing kids ministry this morning, there were greeters this morning, there's a whole tech team upstairs. When you do ministry, if you start to get what I call burnout, Burnout is not a sign that you are doing too much. Burnout is the first sign that you are doing out of duty and not delight. It's the sign that it's all about you. Friends, there's no way you can burn out from a Sunday morning ministry that you do once every other week. That, that doesn't make any sense. If you, if you can't do ministry once every other week, then how do you exist in the real world where you have to work five days a week? How do you exist with kids that you own 24-7? Like, that's just, that's just foolishness. And so it can't be because you're just working on top of work. And if you are, if you secretly are working 80-plus hours a week for your Sunday morning volunteer position, <laughs> something else is wrong with you. There are things that we have to think about. Why am I burning out? Maybe my works are duty. Maybe it's more about me than it is about the delight of Christ and the discipleship of those whom he's put in my path. But here, friend, is the problem. It's not just their love of God. It starts with the love of God. It always starts vertically. But that vertical loss extends then horizontally. Ephesus not only has lost their love of God, they've lost their love of neighbor. They're doing great works. They are testing false apostles to make sure that their wrong is displayed. But here's the thing. 
they're testing and they're working and testing to be right, not to be fruitful. Did you hear that? You can do works to be right, to, to make sure you're doing righteous things, but it's not because you care about the fruitfulness of, uh, of God's mission. You care about this image. You care about doing the right things. I mean, Paul, again, speaking to the church in Ephesus, Ephesians 4.15 says, says, this is what we do. We speak the truth in love, which allows us to grow in, up in every way into Christ. You can't just speak the truth. You have to speak the truth in a way, in a loving way. When our vibrant love for Jesus grows cold, this does not necessarily mean that we look less Christian. And here's the greatest danger for the Christian. It's when your love for God grows cold while you are still externally acting Christian. You'll exchange delight, in Christ for the duty of man and you exchange the worship of Christ for the worship of self which creates a self-righteousness. Just look at the Pharisees in the Gospels. That's what happens. Duty, no delight. You become a bitter pill to be around. Why? Because you end up beating people up with the truth. Friends, we have to remember this. The scriptures tell us our battle is not against flesh and blood. Our battle is not against those who have different beliefs in us. That's the mission. The mission are the lost. The battle is against, against Satan and evil and, the, and these spiritual principalities that are trying to corrupt humanity. When our heart grows cold against those who are not Christians, those who disagree, the problem is we're now cut off from the mission. I don't want to see you saved because I don't like you. I'm frustrated with you. We, we end up beating people up with truth instead of loving them and revealing why we want them to follow truth so that we can engage in relationships both vertically and horizontally. Jesus has some words about this, Matthew chapter 7. He says, take the log out of your own eye before you take the speck out of your brother's eye. Notice there's something in both eyes. Both people have something wrong. The problem, though, is when we don't think anything's wrong with us. And that speck grows and grows and grows until it becomes a log, which is not going to help us see. Because it's going to distort truth. So what does Jesus say to the church in Ephesus? He says three things. Remember, repent, and respond. Remember from where you have fallen. Remember the vibrancy and the intimacy of relationship with Jesus that allows these horizontal relationships to be so rich. Repent. Which again, let me just remind you, repentance is not being sorry. Sorry. Repentance is a change of mind that results in a change of actions. If your actions have not changed, you have not repented. You can tell me all day, I'm sorry, and I'm not going to do that. I'm going to change. But if you don't change, you have not repented. Stop saying, I'm practicing repentance. It's just not working. What's not working is your repentance. It's not real. It's not full. And that's why we need each other. A healthy accountability to pray, to persevere, to actually rest in the power of the Spirit, to really work on that change of mind. Why do you want to repent of sin? Do you see sin as that wretched thing that it is that holds you into slavery? Or do you just know that's not the best choice? That really wasn't a good thing to do. You'll never repent of anything unless you take it seriously. That change of mind resulting in a change of action. We remember, we repent, and then we respond. We do the works we did at first. And that's not a specific kind of work. It's a, it's a specific way of working with worship, with adoration, with joy, with the desire to, to see the works that we're doing bear fruitfulness for the mission of God. To see salvation. To see sanctification. 
And Jesus gives a warning. If you do not do this, I will come to you and remove your lampstand. What does that mean? You, uh, you will no longer be a church. I'll remove your light. This is very similar to the Jews in exile. Jerusalem was supposed to be a beacon of light. The temple, the dwelling place of God. Not only being a beacon for all Jews and in the surrounding nation of Israel, but for the world. And instead, they corrupted themselves. The final consequence of that was to be exiled and Jerusalem destroyed. Well, praise be to God. God does not attach himself to one nation alone any longer. He calls all people of all nations and all tribes to his throne of grace. And so what he does is not destroy nations for their falsehood. He destroys churches. We should be a church that takes this seriously. We want to be light for the kingdom of Christ. And again, Harbor Church is not perfect. If you're here today, maybe you're newer to Harbor and you're looking for a perfect church, I just want to encourage you, you have not found it yet. Keep up the search. But I'd also encourage you to remember the words of Charles Spurgeon, who says, the moment you find a perfect church, you should leave, because you being there has now distorted it. Things to think about. Jesus is walking among his churches. He knows our hearts, not just our external actions, not just what we want him to see. He knows everything deeply and perfectly. There's this little P.S. moment. You hate the work of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. We're going to get into that later. It's, it's, again, this isn't totally agreed on in church history, but the, the most agreements, especially in early church history, is that the Nicolaitans were followers of Nicolaus, who was actually one of the deacons listed in Acts 6. He's actually the last deacon listed. It's thought that he uh, was later swayed by false teaching, and started to teach an early form of Gnosticism. We'll talk about it in just a moment, but just so you have a little idea of what's happening. Basically, a, a, no matter what, we know it's a distortion of the gospel. That's why he hates it. Now we get to the fourth part, the call and the reward. Now watch this. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Again, we need to pray today for working ears. Because there's a lot of things that not only are, 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 are put in front of us to hear, but there's a lot of things that tickle our ears and make us want to listen to them. This is what's called the, the siren song. You familiar with the siren song from Greek mythology? There's the island of the sirens, and they sing this beautiful song, luring sailors to come, and sailors intoxicated with their singing and their beauty end up crashing their ships and shipwrecking themselves due to them. What siren songs do we listen to today? What are the calls that, that latch on to us specifically? He who has an ear, let him hear. To the one who conquers, I will grant. To the one who conquers. This is, the Greek word is the word that the famous sports brand Nike derives its name from. It means to be victorious, to conquer, to overcome. This is to the one who faithfully endures. And what will he grant to the church in Ephesus? I will grant you to eat of the tree of life, which is the paradise of God. Again, the tree of life is a hearkening back to Genesis 2, 9. It is what Adam and Eve would eat to live eternally, never dying. And so the promise is to repent, is to remember to repent and respond so that you can come and feast with God eternally. Does that sound good to anyone? Church number two, Smyrna. Here we go, verse number eight. And to the angel of the church in Smyrna write the words of the first and the last who died and came to life. Remember that. Again, Jesus isn't just repeating stuff that he already told John. He's saying things now specifically to specific churches. This is why we have to know who God is. Not just, again, our imagination, not just our version. The biblical picture, because that entire biblical picture 
of who God is comes to play in different areas and aspects and times of our life. Watch this. What's the encouragement? He goes on in verse 9, I know your tribulation and your poverty, but you are rich. And the slander of those who say that they are Jews and are not, but are a synagogue of Satan. Jesus knows their tribulation, their suffering, distress, their affliction, their trouble. Not only their tribulation, but their poverty, their actual physical lack. But he puts this sidebar in, but you are rich. Again, reminding them of their spiritual reality. What does Jesus say to do? Store up your treasure in heaven. Not in barns here that will rust and decay, but into the eternal places. They are rich through their suffering. Not only does Jesus know their tribulation and their poverty, he knows that the slander that's been done against them. Blasphemy by Jews, again, physical Jews, but not spiritually, not healthy uh, Jews, Jews that, are, that have been intoxicated by the comforts of the Roman Empire. Let me give you some context, and this is going to play out in the next two specifically. The Roman Empire, we have to remember, was a very spiritual world, pantheistic to the core, many, many, many gods. And again, every, every place that the Roman Empire would conquer, they basically allow you to keep doing whatever worship. They just added it to the pantheon. That was why Jews were so odd in the, in, in the Roman Empire is because they were a monotheistic, a religious culture that, that looked very weird to, to, the, to the, Roman, um, the Roman citizen. One of the things, especially in in this part of Asia, which is now modern-day Turkey, one of the things that we need to understand is, is, is the reality of worker unions, right? Anyone a part of the union here, right? You got different unions, carpentry and, 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 and teacher union, right? And fi- firefighters and all kinds of, you have unions. Imagine if you're a part of the union, just, you imagine you're in the union, you go to your union meeting, and guess how your union meeting starts? Well, if we're the, let, let's say we are the, uh, we're the piano union. And we go to our piano union meeting, and they're like, well, let's start out by singing a hymn to our chosen patron god, the god of piano keys, Jupiter, let's call his name. And you start singing to Jupiter, and then they're like, you know what, we're going to move to our worship time of a feast. Does anyone have offerings they're going to give to Jupiter so that we would continue uh, to make sure that our piano playing is good and loved by the citizens? And then you'd offer some sacrifices, then you'd get around tables and you'd eat that sacrifice. The unions were highly worshipful. They had chosen gods, chosen patron gods, and they would, their, their meetings were highly religious, uh, not only sacrifices, but the feasting from that sacrifice. And so all these worker unions in the Roman Empire, carpentry, smithing, engraving, each had a god, and their union meetings were worship events where meat was sacrificed to their gods for their favor. Christians, obviously, would abstain from these events from eating this food. Well, what happens, and we know this even today, what happens if, if basically the union dominates your work field and you choose not to be a part of the union? How's it going to go for you in trying to find work? It's going to be pretty hard. You're basically going to only have work from the people you know, maybe your friends or relatives that kind of get your name out. You're going to be kind of the right uh, uh, black market, whatever that is, trying to get some work. Well, not only did this hurt Christians, but because Jews wanted to be separated from Christians, and kind of they were lumped together. Oh, Christians, Jews, what's the difference from people outside, uh, regular Roman citizens? They'd look at Jews and Christians and think that it's all one of the same, those mono, monotheistic weird people. Well, Jews didn't want to be associated with Christians. And so Jews began to turn in Christians to Roman authorities, which put more pressure, tribulation, suffering, and poverty upon them. So hear this, the Christians in Smyrna were experiencing the consequences of being faithful to Jesus in their everyday lives. Wow. It wasn't poverty because they were giving to the missions fund. It wasn't poverty for any other reason than they actually were living as Christians Monday through Saturday. And that was greatly affecting their ability to actually provide. So now, this is what's interesting. Smyrna now does not get a rebuke. Instead, they get a warning. Uh, uh, Watch this verse 10. 
do not fear what you are about to suffer. I just Can we just stop? Didn't we just read that <laughs> I know your tribulation, your poverty, the slander, right? And now he's like, hey, guess what? Just starting. <laughs> Super encouraging. Do not fear what you are about to suffer. Behold, the devil is about to throw some of you into prison that you may be tested, and for 10 days you will have tribulation. Be faithful unto death, and I will give you the crown of life. Do not fear for what you are about to suffer. Again, they're already suffering. The devil is about to throw some of you into prison. You went from slander to poverty to prison. I would ask you, when does your faith just tap out? What is the point for you when your faith just goes, okay, we've had enough? I'd encourage you to think about that this week. What would be the moment for you when your faith just goes, enough King Jesus? I want you to be real honest and find that place. And then I want you to repent. Because that shows that your faith is in yourself and not in Christ. These are moments where we can go, okay, God, you got to help me because I know that would be tremendously hard. For me, if anything ever happened to my kids, that would be tremendously hard for me. So I know my weakness now. So I know how to pray. God, stir me up in this area. Stir me up. Help me faithfully endure. They're going to be tested for 10 days. Again, 10 days, again, a number that's not, he's not talking literal 10. 10 is used as a number for fullness, completeness. It's usually longer than it is shorter. So this is not going to be an easy prison sentence. And in fact, he says, be faithful unto death. Not only, again, have you suffered through persecution and slander and poverty and, and prison, but some of you, that's going to be the end faithfully endure. And what's the call? What's the reward? I will give you the crown of life, it says at the end of verse 10. This is James chapter 1, verse 12. Blessed is the man who remains steadfast under trial, for when he has stood the test, he will receive the crown of life, which God has promised to those who love him. 1 Corinthians 9, 24 through 25. Do you not know that in a race all the runners run, but only one receives the prize? Run that you may obtain it. Every athlete exercises self-control in all things. They do it to receive a perishable wreath, but we an imperishable. Again, this harkens back to the Olympians and the Olympic Games would receive a a laurel crown, a crown with uh, leaves and holly and things that, again, would decay. Uh, This isn't a crown, like, again, I don't know why, but you think of Burger King, you know, that little crown, uh, uh, um, kind of created after the medieval crowns that kings and queens would wear again. They have no, no one at that time. Not even the Roman emperor wore a crown of, of gold. That, that wasn't uh, even a thing. And so this imperishable, like their crown was actually, it, 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 was, uh, it was perishable. It, it would wither and die. But we don't have a crown like that. We have a crown that will never perish, eternal. Verse 11, he who is an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. The one who conquers will not be hurt by the second death. We're going to get into this later on in Revelation. What is the second death? Second death is the eternal judgment. It's the lake of fire for those who do not believe. For those who believe in Christ, we will not be judged because we're covered by the righteousness of Christ. So, he will give the crown... And he assures that you won't be hurt by the second death. Remember who Jesus said he was at the very beginning of this letter to Smyrna? He says, I am the first and the last who died and came to life. He's specifically reminding them. He's not just giving who who I am that has no relation to them. He's saying, some of you are going to go to prison. And some of you are going to die. Remember who I am. I'm the one who died and came to life. What did Jesus say earlier in the the letter? I hold the keys of death and Hades. All these things are going to be not just things that the churches need to endure and persevere through. They need to first believe. Do you believe in Jesus? Do you believe that he holds the seven stars and he walks among the seven churches knowing actually what they're made of? Do you believe that Jesus did die on the cross and rose again? Because that's going to bear how you live this faith out. Church number three, Pergamum. 
verse 12, and the angel of the church in Pergamum writes, the words of him who is the sharp two-edged sword, remember that. Here's the encouragement. I know where you dwell, where Satan's throne is, yet you hold fast my name and you did not deny my faith. Even in the days of Antipas, my faithful witness, who was killed among you where Satan dwells. This idea Satan dwells and Satan's throne. Uh, we're not sure exactly what this means. Uh, co- commentators, uh, again, it could be uh, the culture and context was there was a huge statue of Zeus on a throne there and just heavy, crazy worship there. In fact, Pergamum became the city. It was known as the seat uh, of, of the Roman imperial cult. It kind of begged the emperor to, to, it was the first city to beg the emperor to be able to worship him as a god outside of, uh, uh, again, outside of Rome itself. And so it did a lot, it just a crazy pantheistic city of, of, of crazy false worship. And so he's saying, yet, even in this context, you hold fast my name. You don't deny my faith. Even when Antip- Antipas, who again, we don't know who this is, could have been their pastor, could have, could have been uh, just a faithful uh, uh, witness of Jesus. Uh, even when he was killed, when he was martyred, you still held, the fa- you still held fast. You, you did not deny. Again, verse 14, but I have a few things against you. You, you have some there who hold to the teaching of Balaam, who taught Balak to put a stumbling block before the sons of Israel so they might eat food, sacrifice to idols, and practice sexual immorality. So also you have some who hold to the teaching of the Nicolaitans, therefore repent, if not, I will come to you soon and war against them with the sword of my mouth. Some of you hold to the teaching of Balaam. Again, uh, Balaam, Balaam, it, it was this figure in Kings in the Old Testament. And he was a false prophet used by Balak to corrupt the Jews. And, and, and Balak wanted to destroy the Jews, and, but he couldn't. Nothing worked against them. God protected them. And so Balaam ended up conquering them uh, by destroying them and corrupting them from within. Basically made the nation of Israel become like the nations around it. And that's what he's saying. Some of you hold to these same, these same principles. Some of you are so intoxicated with the world around you that you're trying to become it that you're allowing the teachings to, 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 to fall, you're allowing uh, the high doctrine of God, the high call of God uh, to, to fall, to, to be gray instead of black and white so that you can, you can enjoy the temptations and pleasures and sins of this world. Specifically, you're eating food sacrificed to idols. We talked about this. And part, you're participating in pagan practices and you're saying, but I got to work. Again, is that an excuse to be unfaithful to God? And not only are you participating in pagan practices, you're practicing sexual immorality. And this is obviously physical. There's a physical sexual immorality. That, again, a lot of the culture, a lot of the um, different gods of especially the Roman culture, but even in pantheistic uh, worship, th- those festivals were just crazy sexual immorality happening there. Uh, I mean... Uh, yeah, you can look at it. But there's not only the physical reality, there's a spiritual adultery going on. This, this intoxication with trying to be like everyone in pantheism. Again, you, you see this today. How many of you have seen the bumper sticker that says coexist? And it's got the, the, the major symbols of, of the major world religions. Again, every time I see that, I just, I just go, thank you for letting me know how stupid you are. And again, I don't mean to harp on these people, but you have to, you, there's no way you've ever read any of the texts of the world major religions and you can think that we can all coexist. Like the texts don't even work. And you can take Christianity out of it. How does Buddhism and Muslim exist together? They, 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 it's polar apart. The thinking's totally, like it, it's just such a disrespect. It basically, it's just foolishness. And then you add Christianity to that, which message all the other messages are you have to do. You have to attain enlightenment in Buddhism. You have, to, uh, you have to do all these religious works and even martyr yourself in jihad to make sure that you get in in the Muslim faith. In Christianity, we look at all those and goes, that's foolishness. It's not your works. It's the work of Christ. So how does that even, again, coexist? It doesn't even make any sense. Demetrically opposed to each other. And yet, there's a temptation, isn't there? To just go, can't we just, can't we just all get along? Can't we just all kind of merge together and just kumbaya? That's called a, that's not even a love of self. That's a love of the idea of horizontal relationship. 
and a total disregard to God. Not only are some following this heretical teaching, but they're also following the, the Nicolaitans. Again, this is an early form of Gnosticism. Gnosticism at its core is basically this. The body is evil and the spirit is good. So as long as your spirit knows, and as long as your spirit is worshiping God, then your body can basically do whatever it wants. So I'm like, oh, you know what? It's okay to have sex with everyone because my body is evil, but my spirit and my heart, I'm like, oh, but my heart loves Jesus, so I'm okay. It's still going on today, I think. The idea of, well, my, I know what's right in my mind, so as long as I know what's right, and as long as I just love Jesus with my heart, I can really do whatever I want with my body. Again, nothing changes under the sun. And what does Jesus say to this? He says, repent, or you get war with the sword of my mouth. And what is the sword of the mouth of God? Again, truth. You're going to get truth that slays. You think that the world loves you. Wait until I come and reveal what is truly in your heart. That is not going to go well for you. And he gives a call. Here's the reward, verse 17. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says. To the one who conquers, I will give some of the hidden manna, and I will give him a white stone with a new name written on the stone so that no one knows except the one who receives it. Very quickly, again, hidden manna. Manna was what God provided food uh, in the wilderness uh, wouldn't it be good to have food and provision that we didn't have to work for and toil for that was just provided by God? Again, God and his good provision. I will give him a white stone. We don't quite know what this white stone means. Uh, again, it could be a number of things. Uh, a white stone, uh, white and black stones were used in that culture in courtrooms. If you were guilty, you'd have a black stone. If you were not guilty, you'd have a white stone. It could be that. It could also be that a stone was uh, used... They would hand out usually, again, white or uh, maybe if they'd found a unique colored stone. If you were going to go to a special event in the city, they'd hand out these stones. That would be like your ticket, right? And so instead of getting your, your, your ticket or your, your gala invitation showing that, this is my invite, you, you'd be given one of these stones. And so it could be that, this idea of entrance into the kingdom. Who knows? We just know this. Again, it's something that would mean something to that culture. They get that in that culture. They go, wow, okay, yes. They connect their cultural reality to this receiving this gift from God. Now, we do know new names. We look at Abram, who went from Abram to Abraham. Jacob went to Israel. Simon went to Peter. Some of you just aced the Sunday school test. There's something about God changing your name to give you greater purpose to reveal the greater reward. Again, we want our name how beautiful for God to change our name, to give us the name that is a true identity, infused by him, rooted in him. Again, very quickly, Church of Thyatira, the last one. To the angel of the church in Thyatira write the words of the Son of God who has eyes like a flame of fire, whose feet are like burnished bronze. Again, so we're about to look at the church in Thyatira, which was the major bronze producer for the entirety of Asia. Interesting. What's his encouragement to them? He says, I know your works, your love and your faith and your service and your patient endurance, circle it, and that your latter works exceed the first. Man, I don't know about you, but that's a great list. I would love to have that list. That's nice. Not only does he know their love and their faith and their service and their patient endurance, he says, your works now are better than your works at first. You've got a trajectory of maturation and fruitfulness. Man, this is awesome. But, verse 20, but I have this against you. You tolerate that woman Jezebel who calls herself a prophetess and is teaching and seducing my servants to practice sexual immorality and to eat food sacrificed to idols. I gave her time to repent, but she refuses to repent of her sexual immorality. Behold, I will throw her onto a sickbed, and those who commit adultery with her I will throw into great tribulation, unless they repent of her works, and I will strike her children dead. And all the churches will know that I am he who searches mind and heart, and I will give each according to your works." They tolerate that woman Jezebel. Again, Jezebel, an Old Testament uh, woman who was not a prophetess in the Old Testament. She was married to King Ahab, who was a worthless king, king of Israel. And she was wicked to the core. She put hundreds of actual prophets to death. 
Here's the question that I just automatically, it says, you tolerate that woman Jezebel. Can I just ask us, what sins do we tolerate? What do we excuse? What do we put up with? What do we dismiss? That's what's happening here. And they're, they, they're doing some good things. They've got love, faith, service, and patience. Their works are growing and maturing, and they, yet they are tolerating something that is corrupting them from within. This woman who calls herself a prophetess, again, a false title. She's not a true prophetess. There were true prophetesses in the, in the early church. We see that in Acts. And what is she doing with that false title? She's teaching and seducing. That's the fruit. She herself is seduced by the world, and she's calling people to be seduced along with her. Practicing sexual immorality, eating food, sacrifice to idols. These are, again, you're going to see these. These are the two common cultural battles of their day. So I would ask you, what are our cultural battles? What are the battles of our day that make it really hard, right? Well, the, those things are really tempting. Uh, the two that comes to my mind, the first one is just affirming sexual identity. And we're, we're in the heat of it right now. Because again, they just keep adding LGBTQT plus 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 plus. Because again, it changes every moment. You just be the king and queen of your own destination. Wake up and choose your own adventure story. Whatever makes you happy today. But again, that's just worship. It's just, I just got to be happy with myself. You know why we keep adding pluses? Is because those haven't made us happy. And so we got to keep just... Allowing whatever to make us happy. And where, what happens here? The church is caught up. Wow, I want to love these people. I want to. And so we end up embracing and affirming these false identities. They're going to do nothing but cause more chaos. Maybe it's that. Or maybe, again, I believe it's, it's Sanctity of Life Sunday today, if you follow people who make calendars. But here's the issue what about the dismissing of mur uh, just murdering children? Well, you know, it's complicated and complex. What? What? It's not. It's not at all. It's called don't have sex. I don't know about you, but no one got pregnant because they thought about it. Oh, but we should be free to do whatever. See, no one wants to talk about that. No one wants to talk about just this promiscuous society that allows just, but I don't want, responsible. I want responsibility for those actions. So again, well, it's already happened, so what do we do? What do we, we've got to, the church has got to stand ground and got to, again, speak the truth in love, always. But it's got to speak the truth. And to speak the truth, we have to understand what truth is. We have to look at what the battles are. What are our contextual current battles? And how are we going to be uh, swayed to start to say, ah, it's okay, it's okay. What's the result? Jesus says, I'm going to throw her onto the very bed where promiscuity is happening. I'm going to throw her on that and make her sick. And not only am I going to make her sick, I'm going to make everyone who follows her sick. And in fact, the, her children, her disciples, I'm going to kill. It's kind of intense. But again, sin is intense. It requires an intense reality. And then he says, I will give, each, I will give to each according to your works. You want to work for your own self-identity? You want to work for your pleasure? You want to work for that? I'm going to give it to you. And it's going to be like sand in your mouth. Here, 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 here's something you should fear. What if Jesus actually allowed you to get all the things that you're craving? What a grace that Jesus actually keeps us from some of the things we want most. At the end, verse 24, but to the rest of you in Thyatira who do not hold to this teaching, who have not learned what some, what some call the deep things of Satan, to you I say, I do not lay on you any burden. Again, the deep things. This is a very cultural, we see this today. We just crave mystery, don't we? There's just something about mystery, power in secret knowledge. Again, this whole QAnon baloney. Like again, I'm sorry if you've gotten caught up in that. I'd love to talk with you and just wake you up. QAnon is the dumbest thing I've ever seen. Somebody like nine months ago sent me like, you're going to watch this QAnon thing. They sent me two videos, like the two kind of primary videos I guess you get sent to get indoctrinated into this. I just laughed the whole first video. I'm like, 
my five-year-old could have put this together. Who, who is listening to this? And I'll tell you who. People who, who, who fear authority and people who, who believe that the world's just so full of evil that then they swing the pendulum and can believe just nonsense. Nonsense. Do I think that there's corruption in the world? Absolutely. There's been since Genesis 3. It's not surprising. Do I believe that both political parties have more wrong with them than right? Yes. You want to know why? They're made up of sinners. And power corrupts the most corruptibly. And yet, we can't be led then into, into conspiracy. You can't be led by that. That is just, you are just begging for anxiety and fear to run your life. I'm just, okay, I can't even talk about it. I'm so upset about it. I just, the, the people, again, it's because I get texted and sent direct messages all the time about this nonsense. Praise God it's none of you, because if it was, we'd have a talk. But maybe some of you need a talk. But here's the thing, like, When will the accountability be held? It's like these people that say the end of the world is going to be May 20th, 2018. You know what? If you're so bold to say that, when it doesn't come true, you should be executed. Because that's what they did in the Old Testament. If you're a prophet, you, you, you put yourself, I'm a prophet, and you said something and it didn't come true, they killed you. Why? Because they took it seriously. Now I know we're not going to execute anyone today because we've gone soft. <laughs> I'm just saying I'm just saying. Sometimes we got to go back to normal. Okay. Call and reward. Let's get to some good news. Only hold fast, verse 25, what you have until I come. Again, we need to hear that. Who are we holding fast in? In the government, in the QAnons? No, I want to hold fast to Jesus. 26, the one who conquers and who keeps my works until the end, to him who keeps my work until the end, to, to him I will give authority over the nations, and he will rule them with a rod of iron as when earthen pots are broken with pieces, even as I myself have received authority from my Father. And I will give him the morning star. He who has near, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Again, hold fast and conquer. Again, I quoted from last week. We talked about Braveheart. We'll talk about this week. Hold. Hold. Right? How many of you just need to Hold. And again, some of you, the problem is you're holding in your own power. You're not empowered by the Spirit. You're going to the well of self, and again, you're going to fall. Again, you give authority. This is back to Genesis 1 again, when God gave dominion and authority to Adam and Eve to rule over his creation. He will give the morning star. Again, we're going to see this. He will give Jesus. He will give himself. Jesus is the morning star, Revelation 22, 16. Let's close, because we're way over. Big idea. The church of Jesus exists in a sinful world where it is attacked, it is maligned, it is wooed to fall into destruction. We have to be aware of that reality. We don't live in a world that applauds the church. The, the world designs to attack it, malign it, and woo it to corruption. The only way for the church to remain rooted and effective is to set our eyes on the promises of King Jesus and to depend on his spirit for empowered living. What does Jesus promise to these four churches? To eat from the tree of life in the paradise of God. To give hidden manna, the, the provision that was given without toil and labor. To give a white stone possibly to be not guilty and to be received in, to receive a new name, a, a new identity rooted in what God has done in us and through us, to be given authority and to be given the crown of life. Man, any, anyone else that sounds good? But here's the world's distortions. The world promise you, promises you food, except it's false. It doesn't satisfy. It gives you, promises you false identity that never lasts. Pro promises, you, promises you false authority and power that is corrupt. And plenty of false achievements, but we know they never last. Y you know, my story, when I was a, a kid, uh, I was in, I, th I think it was in first grade. I believe it was in first grade. And, and I always wanted to be the best. I always wanted to be the best. If we went out to recess, I had to be the best at whatever we were playing. And I always wanted to be the tallest, too. And, and the problem was, we had a Dutch kid named William Seitzma in, in my elementary school. He's my best friend throughout elementary school. And he was a six-foot-tall Dutch man in, in first grade. 
So there was no chance I was ever going to be the tallest in our class. But I'd always, in all the pictures, remember the class pictures you used to take? I'd always be on my tiptoes like, like this, like trying to get, and I'd always stand next to him to try to be, and that was the goal. Someday I knew I'd be taller than him. But in, in first grade, we were playing outside on this stump. We found this stump at recess time, and we were playing King of the Hill. And William, of course, because he's a Dutch man with like five foot wingspan, would just like swap us away, like right fleas and giants. And, and so I just remember, finally, I can't remember, I think Cordell or Matt Klein, one of my other Kajuga friends, they distracted him, and I pushed him off, and I was the king. And friends, I don't know about you, but once you get power, you can't give it up, can you? And so William, with his big man hands, started just coming at me and trying to get me and trying to get me. And I was just in my stubborn German-Norwegian Viking prowess fighting him off. No one was going to get this hill until finally William got so frustrated, boom, he just slapped me. And after I picked myself up 10 feet away... I came at him and tackled him, and it was on. And the teachers come over, and they pull us apart. And I got to spend the next two recesses writing, I will not fight with my best friend, over and over on the chalkboard. What's sad about that is that moment, while I'll never forget it, didn't change me. It didn't allow me to look in and really deal with something that was in me, this need to be this need to achieve. So my life has been a resume of achievement. I went and full ride scholarship to the undergrad school of my choice. Went to one of the most prized music schools in the nation. Budding star, My life has been marked by chasing the world's accolades. And it was actually in New York, up in a lake house I lived at, where God clearly revealed the reality of two trajectories. If you want to know why my word is trajectory, it's because it means more to me than it will ever mean to you. God showed me clear, you can go after these things of the world. Oh, they taste good in the moment but you've already experienced the falseness to them. The riches are false, the identity is false, the pleasure is false. It does not satisfy. And he showed me another trajectory, and he said, here's the trajectory. You know what? As I've read Revelation, it reminds me of Smyrna. It looks like trials and tribulations and hardship. But he said, there, you will find what you're truly looking for. That moment in New York began to plant a seed in my mind. But can I just be real honest with you? The entirety of my life up to this moment and the entirety of my life until I meet Jesus is a war zone where I have to fight against longing for the things of this world versus the things of Christ. If I, your pastor, have to fight day by day through remembrance, repentance, and responding to Christ. I think all of us probably have the same road ahead of us. The question again is, are we aware of the world's beckoning? Are we aware of the siren song that plays? What's your siren song? How is the world calling to you? Where are your eyes? Where is your mind? Where is your heart set? For the Christian, the daily practice is to set those things to Jesus, the author, the perfecter, and the finisher of our faith. Only there, only in him, will we be able to conquer, to overcome, and to receive the promises of King Jesus. Father God, I pray for us. As we look at these four churches, that we would be mindful first and foremost of who Jesus reveals himself to be and that we would take that to heart, both to trust and to fear, to have a healthy fear of who God is. 
in Christ. Father, I pray that we look at the encouragements and we'd ask ourselves, are these reminiscent of our life? Are these marks of our life, these works and toils and patient endurance? And then I, think, I pray that we would look at the, at the rebukes and the warnings and we would ask God, would you just clearly show and reveal where these are in my life? Would you show and reveal how, uh, how the rooted things haven't changed in 2,000 years, but would you reveal clearly how, what are the current temptations that I struggle with, that I get called to? And then, God, as we begin to work through this by the power of the Spirit within us, would we then hold on to the promises? Would we see those as better than anything the world can offer us? Would we desire the crown of life that will never perish, that we would lay down before you when we see you face to face? Do a work in us now as we remember who you are and what you've done. We repent and confess of sin and apathy and foolishness. And as we respond by walking in the things you've ordained for us. We pray this in the name of Jesus. We said, amen.